Um, so let's get started. Um, well, just a second. Okay, so what are we going to discuss today? Uh, we have an interesting session plan. So we'll uh, agenda. Where are you? Here you are. Okay, so we'll start by talking about the shift from analytics to data applications. I mean, we titled this session Data Applications. What is a data application to begin with? I'll share how I see that. And we'll talk about how modern cloud data warehouses come to the rescue when it comes to data applications and enable that. Uh, we're going to talk about the shift from ETL to ELT, which also plays a very significant role in making data applications real. And also how Airflow is really at the center of orchestrating that whole thing and making it easy and real. Uh, I will cover and show you Firebolt as well uh, and show you some examples. So, so let's get to it. So let's set the stage by talking about why, what I even mean with data applications and how that is actually an evolution from just what we used to call analytics. So once upon a time, you know, when we were talking about analytics, it was at most gigabyte scale. Uh, whereas today, you know, when we talk about analytics and especially data applications, we are already starting to see more and more companies reaching terabyte scale. And you know, if you're not on terabyte scale already, the only thing that you can know for sure that in the future you will be. Uh, it's only going in the terabyte scale direction and not the other way around. Um, let's continue with the comparison of how it used to be versus today. So, you know, once upon a time, analytics was all about batch and historical analysis, whereas today our requirements from analytics are much tougher. We want real time, we want analytics to become operational. So as opposed to just using analytics for historical decision-making, we want it to be there with us on an operational level, helping us in every step of the way. Uh, so it's getting tougher for analytics. Also, you know, in the past, analytics was traditionally used for internal use cases, typically BI. But more and more we see it extending from internal use cases also to customer facing use cases with, with companies, you know, extending their analytics to serve customer experiences with rich data experiences. Um, also concurrency has changed. If in the past, you know, analytics was internal used by some, Today, also for internal use cases, suddenly we have many more user, users relying on analytics. And because it's gone customer facing as well, concurrency has also become more challenging to deal with. And if in the past we were okay with analytics taking seconds, five seconds, 10 seconds, even more, today when we talk about operational use cases, customer facing use cases, we really want a faster experience. I typically say if an analyst waits 15 seconds for a query, nobody loves it, but we're not necessarily willing to spend money to solve it. Whereas when we serve analytics to our customers, we really want that cutting edge data experience as well when we're dealing with operational data experiences. So this is where we have to go sub second. And what does it all mean? I mean, if the challenge has gone so much tougher, uh, what does it mean about the people dealing with it? So another trend we see is, whereas in the past, Analytics was served by data warehouse specialists, data architects, and analysts on top. The skill set has become different. Today, data engineers and developers are at the center of building those data applications that are represented by the requirements on the right column here in this table. Um, data engineers, which was a role that came out of you know a supporting data science kind of world, grew to be just a role that does everything related to delivering production grade data experiences. And even in the software engineering world, when we talk about developers, more and more developers these days, their day job is to literally build data applications, is to deliver production grade data experiences, uh, as opposed to the past when these were actually not the typical things developers used to do. Analysts, of course, are still a very important part of the game. So I hope this helps you understand what I mean by data applications, but let's continue. I mean, let's talk about why this shift is so important. We definitely see a big trend in the market where the demand for data applications, as opposed to traditional analytics, is really blowing up. And there are a variety of reasons for it. So um, first, data in itself, data is literally becoming the product for more and more companies. We see companies that are built and started every day and where the business model is, I will get data in a variety of industries and I will serve it to my customers in a way that they can analyze it and draw insight out of and pay for it. Uh, so data is the actual product for many, many more companies than it used to be. And 
companies in all industries are starting to compete in a very dramatic way about who delivers better, deeper, broader, faster analytic experiences to their end users. Uh, we also see homegrown data applications becoming a very big deal. If in the past, you know, you had your BI for analytics and decision making, and you had your CRMs, ERPs, and third-party applications for to run your operations, we see more and more companies building their own homegrown application based on their big data lakes and collected uh, data to really go into a better level of operational excellence. And that's driving demand for these data applications as well. And that's why we see data engineers and developers building their applications for internal use cases, external use cases, and so forth. Uh, let's see a couple of really quick examples of data applications in the real world from our customer, our customer base at uh, Firebolt. Uh, just a second. OK. So let's look at this slide. Take a look at this dashboard here, uh, actually a variety of uh, things. So what you see here is from a company called Similar Web. You might have heard of them, they're IPO'd recently. But Similar Web is a product that enables marketers to understand how traffic comes to their website, to their competitor's website, uh, which keywords people are using for, and so forth. Very helpful for competitive analysis and just for marketing campaign analysis and, and things of that sort. And if you know market tech a little bit, you know that these companies really have tons of data. So we're talking about terabyte scale, dozens of terabytes. Um, and you know the space in, this, in which this company co uh, competes is all about delivering better data analysis for its customers. And every feature that they release behind the scenes, you know, points to a variety of query engines that are out there in the market. Uh, and they came to Firebolt to be able to deliver a new feature set, uh, actually all the things you see on screen. Uh, and the challenge was to deliver it at sub-second at huge data volumes without them being able to find a good sort of cost-effective uh, uh, query engine for it. And Firebolt really did the job. But the point is not Firebolt here. The point is that these kinds of data experiences are becoming more and more popular. And what the most of them share in common as time goes by is that they rely on bigger data sets, uh, more challenging data sets, uh, more frequently refreshing data sets. And this is what data applications are, are all about. But it doesn't have to be such a polished customer facing product. Data applications can also be a dashboard. Now, this is a different use case from a company called Apps Flyer uh, in the ad tech space. Uh, and they had the Looker dashboard. And you might say to yourself, why is the Looker dashboard even considered a data application? Well, it depends how you use it. This Looker dashboard is really operational. It's being used by uh, hundreds of customer success managers across the world to support the Apps Flyer customer base. It refreshes uh, every 10 to 15 minutes. It runs on 32 even more, or over 40 billion rows. Uh, and it's used for minute by minute decision making. If this goes down, uh, it's a big problem for the business. So you should start thinking about your dashboards as operational as well if they're used in this pattern, if they become more than just decision making in off hours, but and then turn into actual operational supporting tools. Uh, OK, now let's talk about go back to the theory a little bit and talk about uh, modern cloud data warehouses and what role they play in helping us deliver these uh, data applications in a better fashion. So first, what is the modern cloud data warehouse anyway? I mean, when we talk about data applications and you know these big data challenges, typically data warehouses have actually not been the go-to technology. Uh, but this is starting to change. And modern cloud data warehouses uh, data warehouse is first a cloud native SaaS data warehouse. Uh, I encourage you, if you look are looking for your next technology to power your uh, modern data application, go for cloud native SaaS products, meaning not an architecture that was built for on-prem and has been transitioned to the cloud, but rather something that has been built from the ground up for the cloud. Um, and something that is built for data lake architectures. A modern cloud data warehouse is intended to complement your data lake and to be able to support the data volumes that are at data lake scale. And finally, a modern cloud data warehouse has to deliver elasticity through decoupled storage and compute. And for example, this is why I don't consider Redshift a modern cloud data warehouse. It was the first cloud data warehouse. But when I say modern today, we need to really 
double down on that concept of decoupled storage and compute. And we'll spend a little bit time now to discuss how this is so crucial in delivering uh, data applications. Um, one small comment, uh, important to notice, there are two sort of flavors of decoupled storage and compute architectures, serverless and user-controlled com compute flavors. The serverless products are products like Athena and Google BigQuery. This is where you throw data uh, to the storage layer and start asking questions through your queries without making any decisions on compute versus products like Snowflake and Firebolt where you can choose which size of cluster you want. And uh, these are sort of two flavors that the distinction is something you have to be aware of. But why is the concept of decoupled storage and compute I mean, so crucial. Let's talk about that a little and understand how it's crucial to deliver these data applications at scale. So in the old coupled world where storage and compute were sort of coupled with the same hardware, you had your big cluster, everything, every workload you had essentially was competing for the same resources in that cluster. Whereas in the world of decoupled storage and compute, you can simply spin up isolated resources per workload. And when you have that competition over resources, you spend a lot of time worrying about queues and priority management, and how can I make sure that you know, uh, queries from department A don't slow down queries from department B or my production queries and so forth. Whereas in the decoupled storage and compute world, well, again, you can just simply spin up isolated resources per workload. Every department can have different resources. There's no uh, competition for resources, much more simpler, and you can guarantee different SLAs for different workloads. Uh, another difference is that in the coupled world, you have you know, you size your cluster based on your most sort of difficult requirements. And that giant cluster is always up and you have to keep it up and pay for it even at times during the day when it's not that loaded. Whereas in the new world, you can start and stop and pull and bring back different sizes of clusters really on demand uh, and only pay for the clusters when you use them. And when nothing's happening, you can actually pay nothing because everything stopped. Uh, scaling is also much more complex in the old world. So let's say you have your big cluster and time goes by and data grows and it starts to choke. You have to manage a complex migration process to a new cluster that's bigger. Whereas in the new world, it's just one click. So the old world really doesn't fit modern development practices from the software engineering world. Whereas in the new world, suddenly we see the unlockment of CI, CD practices, uh, practices from the software engineering world. And if you're a data engineer or a software engineer, you really have used either a smile on your face on the right side versus a frown if you're uh, using a, a cup of storage and compute architecture. Uh, another angle to look at it is specifically in the ETL versus ELT world, uh, which is also a big deal. And let's understand why. So ETL, uh, you know, when we're talking about data lake scale, Essentially, the data lake, when we had coupled storage and compute warehouses, was the only place where you could run scale out workloads. Um, your data warehouse had its resources, but you couldn't dynamically change them. And transformation workloads often require very hefty resources. In the ELT world, you can run scale out workloads in your data warehouse, in your cloud data warehouse. And suddenly, uh, transformations become possible in it. Uh, setting up ETL pipelines is much more labor intensive in the ETL world. You need different tools, you often need coding, Spark is often the go-to technology, uh, whereas in the ELT world, you only need SQL. It runs in your data warehouse, you run transformation with SQL, less programming required, time to delivery is faster. Uh, and also from a risk perspective, the ETL world was much more dangerous. If you had one big cluster, with coupled storage and compute, running your transformation logic in it was risky because it would slow down your production queries or God forbid, take your cluster down. Whereas in the ELT world, you can run your transformation logic, logic with isolated compute resources, not affecting the production queries. And that's why in the ETL world, iterations are slow. You typically needed multiple departments to collaborate and an integration team, a data warehousing team, requirements moving from one to the next. In the ELT world, you have your data engineer, your developer, often being able to do much more and often just with SQL. Uh, so we're talking about much accelerated development cycles. Um, so some of these uh, benefits 
uh, in conclusion and how they relate to uh, the work of data engineers and developers, we really see things to the benefits of decoupled storage and compute and of being able to run ELT instead of ETL, we're seeing really development paradigms for data changed and being unlocked. One example is being just being able to set up and the ease of use that we have in setting up new environments. Uh, for example, setting up a dev staging production environment in the decoupled storage and compute world is a no-brainer. Whereas in the coupled world, it's an issue. It's like spinning up two different uh, warehouses. Uh, another difference is data testing, which is literally becoming a standard in today's data world. Uh, when you can assign testing workloads with isolated resources and easily clone and, and, and um, uh, work in multiple environments, uh, it's easy to see how that is slowly becoming the standard. And we see data ops really being reborn. We can bring CI, CD, DevOps practices, version control into the world of data warehousing. Uh, and, and that's amazing because this will allow teams to move faster and with more confidence with data. To conclude, essentially we're saying that, you know, in today's world with the challenges of big data, we cannot rely on the old ways of dealing with data. We have to rely on, we have to lend principles from DevOps, from software engineering and apply them to how we work with data. And this can all be enabled thanks to what separation of compute and storage have given us and many of the other benefits that come with the modern cloud data warehousing world. Airflow remains key. So again, let's think of the modern cloud data warehouse as an enabler for modern data ops. We see an amazing explosion in the data ecosystem uh, of libraries, products that are all about making our data ops better. DPT is becoming a standard for ELT Libraries like Great Expectations and DQ allow us to do data testing. Meltano is an example of a product that sort of combines many of these things together in a single package, and there's, there's many more. But whatever you use, Airflow is, is there to orchestrate all of these things. Uh, and it's much more easier to orchestrate things with Airflow in a cloud data warehouse that has these modern benefits than it used to be when you combine multiple tools. Your pipelines can become shorter, much more SQL oriented. So even developing Airflow orchestration becomes easier. Uh, now, I do want to shift to Firebolt. Um, if we look at this slide again, let's uh, not think that modern cloud warehouses solve everything like this. Uh, if we have an environment where we have terabyte scale and we have high concurrency and we have sub-second response time as a requirement, the modern cloud data warehouses don't really solve it that easily for us. Not yet. And this is where Firebolt comes into play. So Firebolt is a relatively new cloud data warehouse in this market. And we see ourselves as starting where the modern breed of cloud data warehouses sort of end. Uh, our main differentiators are speed, scale, and efficiency. Speed, Firebolt is the fastest cloud data warehouse out there. Uh, typically by an order of one or two orders of magnitude. That's something that we typically show as the first thing in every POC. Scale, uh, we built on an elastic decoupled storage and compute architecture. Uh, it would be funny if after spending so much time on decoupled storage and compute, Firebolt wouldn't be built on such an architecture, but I don't know where we are. So it's easy to scale with a few clicks uh, and really assign the right workloads to the right hardware. And maybe most importantly, efficiency, because Firebolt is not just fast and scalable, we know how to do that without being very hungry for CPU. And this is what reduces costs and suddenly allows you to build data applications that were often out of budget before. So we see ourselves as the fastest way to allow you to build the fastest data experiences. Uh, when you think about performance, and I want to now sort of allow you to a little bit to understand how we were able to be so fast as a company. Just to set the stage, if you look at the market in general, if you Google benchmark performance, Google uh, BigQuery, Redshift, etc., typically Snowflake, the first Google results you get is this benchmark published every year by Fivetran, which is a great benchmark. We're not there yet, but one day we will be. But you can see that already from the one terabyte data range, uh, the median of query response times in this benchmark is eight to 11 seconds. And if you look at the histograms, uh, you might notice that many queries even go beyond 20 seconds. So that's, and, and most existing warehouses are, and query engines, you know, are pretty comparable in terms of performance. Firebolt is all about delivering sub-second performance easily over one terabyte and dozens of terabytes and beyond. And the way we do that 
it's really a, a big stack of proprietary technology. One very important building block that I want to spend time explaining uh, is our proprietary file format that runs under the hood. So one thing that is unique in our technology is that we have this file format called triple F. You see it here uh, in the middle to the left a little bit. When we pull data into Firebolt, we convert it into this triple F format. Uh, the triple F format is a sorted, compressed, and indexed file format. It's indexed by a type of index called a sparse index. A sparse index is an index that doesn't point to particular rows, but to ranges of data in a sorted uh, data range. And what it does is, first, it's, it's relatively small. It can remain small by pointing to huge data volumes, data volumes in data lake scale, scale, so it's typically in RAM. But when a query comes in, the sparse index tells the query which very particular ranges of data to pull from storage, only the ones that participate in the query. And what it does, it, it, it essentially creates very extreme data pruning. It means that much less data is scanned compared to other query engines. And this is very important because in the cloud, uh, when we have these huge data sets and our analytic queries, queries at the end of the day, most of the time look at fractions of the big data set, we do a lot of data scanning to figure out which portions of the data our queries need. Um, so sparse indexing really reduces the amount of data that is scanned and the amount of data that moves around. And this in itself typically create creates a huge performance gain. And it's one of the very foundational building blocks in how uh, Firebolt manages uh, storage in a tightly coupled way with indexing. To the right side of the slide, on the CPU side, you see another set of technologies that is, comes more from the uh, coroner database world and vectorized processing and an optimizer. I won't go into detail there, but these technologies complement in how uh, the CPU really works to uh, get them as much horsepower as possible for analytic workloads. Now, uh, let me switch to the product for a second. I want to show you Firebolt in action. This is the dashboard, local dashboard I showed you before. It's running on 32 billion rows. I'm going to clear cache and refresh it just to show you how it loads uh, in, in a second. So literally, it's done. The table here at the bottom, here is the SQL behind it. So we're running a select over a 32 billion row table called LTV, doing a few joins, uh, aggregations, case statements, et cetera, uh, group buys and such. And it's running in 0.22 seconds. But the nice thing is that uh, this is not a result cache, meaning if I will play around with the filters, I, sorry, that's clear, I will still get, uh, what did I do here? Here, here it is. I will still get a uh, sub-second performance, or let's increase to a month, uh, still sub-second. And even if I will remove this media source filter to begin with, just to scan much more data, um, I will still be very fast. So I now scanned more data than before, but I'm still around one second. Uh, now let's talk about the decoupled storage and compute. If I open this job down, I can choose which compute resource I want to work with. So I use the $4 per hour resource, but I can say, okay, how about I spend less money, 1.8, and maybe in return get queries that are not as fast because for this workload, it's okay. I will save some money. So I run it again, and instead of 1.08 seconds, I'm waiting 1.75, but it might be worth it if uh, performance is not that important for this query. Uh, and this is the nice thing about the copper storage and compute. You can jump from one resource to another very quickly, uh, get different experiences in isolation. One team can use resource one, another can use resource B. If I go to the database page, this is the database I used at v 4 you can see that it has three engines attached to it. The ingest engine is suitable for ingestion and transformation workloads, essentially ELT, and two others for your analytic workloads. When I create a new database in Firebolt, well, you can simply add as many engines as you want. And on the right side, determine their properties. They can be of any size. Each can have a different configuration. You can play around with different uh, RAM and SSD choices to optimize your price point uh, ratio. Uh, and then when you run running queries, whether it's programmatically or uh, through the SQL workspace, you can choose which resources to attach that to. Uh, at the end of the day, 
let's talk about it from an airflow perspective again. DAGs in Airflow, when we orchestrate environments in production that ingest data, transform data, test data, uh, build environments, test models, actually pretty simple. Uh, ELT suddenly becomes SQL tasks, mostly a Python operator that can throw SQL into the data warehouse. Uh, and the same goes for your libraries that you choose to test your data with. So these are a few examples of pretty simplified uh, attacks that represents how we literally work in the real world. Oftentimes, of course, much uh, fatter or thinner, depending on how many sources you ingest in general. But uh, in the world where you have the couple storage compute with a really highly performant cloud data warehouse and query engine like Firebolt, uh, you can suddenly really implement CI/CD practices uh, at scale and make data, build data applications in production um, in a secure uh, way and, and robust way. So I hope this was helpful. Uh, stay in touch with us if you're interested to, to know more.